Uh, Phil Nottingham is a video strategist at Vistia, and he's a marketing consultant who regularly speaks around the world on video, brand strategy, social media, SEO, and technical marketing. He's deeply passionate about creativity in business and has consulted for some of the biggest and smallest brands in the world. That's me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, what an absolute pleasure it is to be here today. I'm very honored to, to be here and with uh, Cindy and Linda as well. Um, so my name is Phil and I help businesses use video on the internet. Um, and today I thought I'd share with you some of the challenges that they're facing, the movement in that space, and perhaps give you a little peek under some of the things that businesses know but would rather you didn't know about the challenges that they're facing and how they're reacting to them. So we're in a world where increasingly more and more of the web is video-based. The web and the communication used online is moving from text and image towards video. And we're seeing this across the board, not least of all in social media, where now we obviously have YouTube as our primary kind of social media platform for consuming video online. But Facebook now has native video. Twitter has native video. LinkedIn last year launched its video platform. Obviously, Snapchat is mostly video and image based. Instagram increasingly has Instagram stories, which are all video orientated. Facebook Live to promote things that are live streamed. Uh, Instagram TV has launched as well recently. And of course, there's another live streaming platform, Periscope. So we sit in this world where every single social media platform is a video platform. And the primary language of social media is increasingly video. And this is all the while as social media adoption continues to grow across the world. So more and more people are being franchised into social media and using this as a means to communicate with one another, as I'm sure you know. Um, but of course, alongside this, because every social media platform is a video platform, everybody's watching more video. In fact, US adults are now watching nearly six hours of video per day. And where are they watching them? On TV at home? No. Around 90% of videos are watched on mobile devices. So we're in an interesting space where the internet and social media is video-based, and it's also mobile. So it's mobile and it's video, which I'm sure Cindy will talk more about. Um, and we also have a space where organic reach is declining. So it used to be the case that when you publish something on Facebook, the people who liked you on Facebook would, would see it. But uh, innovations like EdgeRank and the increasing demand and competition for uh, eyeballs has meant that Facebook just mean that it's not really easy to get people to see you anymore, meaning that things like Facebook and YouTube and Google are increasingly pay to play. Uh, it is an advertorial platform primarily, and this is how these platforms make the money. And of course, to make more money, they're also controlling more and more of the marketing funnel. So businesses who are trying to get more people to become customers are ending up spending more and more money with Google and Facebook as they offer innovative advertising things like lead capture forms that sit in videos. They will offer things like uh, app installs direct from videos. And all these particular ad buys that allow people to cut out the middleman, cut out some of those uh, focuses on lead nurturing and generation and just go direct to consumer with an offer that they can then quantify in terms of return on investment. So because social media is controlling more of the funnel and it's controlling more of the mind share of customers, we see digital advertising spend continue. And it's continuing to grow, although the rate is actually slowing slightly. But what's growing within that particularly quickly is, of course, digital media spend on video. So we are in a strange and new world where social media is advertorial, social media is video, and video is mobile. All of which to say is that social media marketing is now ostensibly primarily mobile video advertising, which is a slight change in the way in which we might think about things. And the way in which most businesses are adapting to this is very slowly and reluctantly and trying to apply old tactics to a new model, which I'll get into. So we face a world where we think about video as businesses from a very historical mindset. We think about video like TV. It used to be that you would make this 30 second ad and you put that out and people would like it and hopefully that would lead to more purchases in store. But the videos that we deal with on social media are not necessarily representative of that old model of creative. If we think about YouTube, what is the most popular content on YouTube? Anyone? Not cats, good effort. <laughs> It's not, it is closer to Baby Shark. It is oh, music. So uh, Despacito, I think, is the most popular viewed 
uh, video on YouTube. Before that, it was Gangnam Style. And it's music videos that have populated this. And that really speaks to what YouTube is as a platform. If video is oral and visual, YouTube skews slightly more towards the oral aspect of this. You know, you will often put YouTube on in the background and listen to a lecture and be doing other things in a separate tab. Whereas Facebook, on the other hand, is primarily viewed silently. About 95% of views are done silent autoplay. So we're dealing with a media type that, unlike YouTube, that is primarily oral, is perhaps told in a slightly different way, perhaps more like the old original movies of the Charlie Chaplin era. So if video is oral and visual, YouTube is oral and visual, Facebook is far more visual and oral in the storytelling, which means that the kind of content that resonates very well on YouTube does not necessarily work very well on Facebook. The kind of content that works very well on Instagram probably is not going to work on LinkedIn. So we have this world of these plethora of different video platforms, all of which require quite different strategies. And businesses are, are having to therefore think about creative in a very disparate and uh, confusing manner. If we think about a classic strategist two by two, we can see that all these different types of platforms have very different media. So YouTube is very active. You have to search and scroll through and find stuff to watch. Whereas Facebook, you just load up your phone, you scroll, stuff comes to you. It's a different experience, and the media is very, very different. But here is the critical problem that businesses are facing. Back in the day when we were doing TV advertising, video delivery was TV video engagement. You would sat in your living room, an ad would come on, and you had basically the option to watch the ad or go into the other room and make a cup of coffee. But this kind of doesn't work anymore. We're in an interesting space where video delivery is easy to ignore. We can use ad blockers. We can just move into a different tab. We can scroll to a different app. We don't have to engage with video if we don't want to. We all know this from our day-to-day -day experience of watching TV. Often we'll just lean back, stuff will be on in the background, and we'll kind of choose to ignore it. But the entire mobile video advertising industry is predicated on the idea that buying a view is buying engagement. And companies are really not adapted to this new world, and deliberately so, the media companies have not allowed them to do so. So we only really pay attention when we want to, as evidenced as follows. Here is me watching a YouTube ad. And here comes the ad, and oh, I've got distracted by some comments and the sidebar video, and we'll just look around and, and not really watch the ad. Meanwhile, the advertiser still thinks we're watching it, they're still paying, they're still doing all the good stuff and thinking this is a, a relevant view. Of course, it isn't. On Facebook, this is what a view looks like on Facebook. Uh, here comes the ad, and it's gone. And that, nevertheless, is counted as a, a sort of an impression, if you like. Am I impressed by that? No. Uh, so we have this kind of interesting problem, and sort of new stories are just starting to emerge that show that there's this issue whereby the things we are buying as advertisers are not necessarily as advertised. And Google are getting in trouble for you know, charging advertisers for fake views. Um, on Facebook, it was recently discovered or, or that a you know, view is really only a few seconds, and often the, the, account, the amount of views that video says it has is not really... Uh, discounting people passing as they go through, or bots, or all these other factors. So really what a video view means is just a successful page load, a 200 response code. Uh, and this is a kind of problem because we still buy most ads based on views. So brands across small and medium and large and all these people engaging in this video space are trying to ostensibly answer this fundamental question, how do we get people to watch our advertising so that they can engage with us, and hopefully like our brand, and like what we're doing, and buy our stuff. And there's ostensibly three kind of uh, broad spectrums of reactions that I'm seeing to this new landscape. And I'll run you through them all. Uh, the first is to use force. The second is to just lie. And the third is to try and meet the consumer demand in a reasonable manner. So what do I mean by using force? Well, advertisers have always liked to buy things that they can guarantee return on. And if we think about, as I mentioned, the original TV ads, they were very much something. It was a 30-second ad spot in between uh, an ad break on a TV show that lasted for five minutes, and you could buy a few little spots in there. People could not sort of pause or switch channel or anything. They were just forced to watch this particular ad. So you kind of knew if you were getting a certain number of impressions, you were getting that many people to watch and, and roughly engage with the video and know what was going on. And advertisers are loath to change very much. It's a very uh, conservative industry. So in order to meet the demand of advertisers, which is we want to buy stuff as if it was still the 60s, uh, big platforms like Google are just offering more and more, more, and more uh, models of advertising that essentially replicate this old style. 
i.e. unskippable ads. So we see more and more unskippables come in. You'll know this just from playing around on Facebook and Google. If you now watch a long YouTube video, there'll be like 20 different spots where an ad's going to pop up in the middle, and your viewing experience is going to be distracted, and you have to go, oh, that's fine. And occasionally, they'll be uh, skippable with a five-second skip, and occasionally, there will just be the full 15 or, or 30-second length, which is frustrating. Um, and Facebook is serving more and more non-skippables as well, mid-roll adverts. So whatever video you're watching on the platform is now popping up with an ad uh, that somebody uh, has paid to interrupt you with. Because advertisers, of course, have no, idea, no desire to adapt. Their dreams are that they're buying uh, the old-fashioned TV ads, where in reality, we're buying often someone sitting on an iPad just in the middle, kind of playing with whatever and doing multitasking, all these other things. So the problem with this force model of let's just pay to get people to watch our stuff and hope that this has the same effect that it always has done historically in advertising is that it may be doing more harm than good. And there was an interesting new article from the New York Times this week that looked at the problem of the advertising industry that people actually really dislike ads. And there's a real measurement issue here in that no one has quite understood how to quantify the damage that ads do as well as the potential benefit. So if you're interrupting people, it's a fairly safe bet to say if your ad is not particularly good, that's actually going to give them a fairly negative perception of your brand over time rather than a positive one. And yet this is very, very difficult to quantify. Uh, we used to rely on things like you know, branded recall surveys and stuff, but really that just mostly measures awareness. To actually know how people feel about you is very, very hard because all these conversations are happening in walled gardens like WhatsApp and, and Facebook Messenger and Slack where people are conversing about you, but you have no idea what they're saying, which is very hard. So while we may be trying to improve our brand often with advertising, the problem is it doesn't always work because digital advertising doesn't inherently make people like you. It can raise awareness of what you're doing, but in order to make people like you, you have to connect to something bigger. You have to tell a bigger story. You have to do something that's much more connected to their identity and their person. And that's a lot harder. So this initial response of essentially to force people to watch ads doesn't really work terribly well. So what a lot of businesses will then try and do, particularly big brands, is move to strategy number two, which is to lie. Uh, and this starts with the platforms themselves. So Facebook uh, have recently been forced to pay a relatively trivial amount of money by their standards, um, basically just for lying and inflating video metrics. And the reason they do this is fairly straightforward. If you tell a media buyer that you're getting all these views, and they're able to go to their client and go, look, we bought all these views on Facebook for this amount of money, and isn't that great? You know, all these thousands of people saw you, and it was only for this fraction of cost, the advertisers are likely to spend more money in that direction. Now, the problem is this is all a complete fabrication, and we're pretending to the big brands that we're actually buying things that we're not, and that they're getting value that they're really not from the, the, advertising, the advertisements that they're buying. But of course, it's, it's more pernicious than just the faking of views. It's that actually the views themselves probably are not very valuable. So here's an example from a, a video that uh, I published fairly recently. Um, we can look at the report in Facebook, and it will tell us that there's about 30,000 minutes viewed, um, and 83,000 three-second views. Okay, that seems like a kind of good amount of engagement that we should care about. But if we actually dig into what's going on in the background, the audience retention shows that 95% of those views are just people going <laughs> on their phone and not really engaging. So all of those minutes viewed are in three-second bytes. And can we legitimately say that a three-second interaction with a video is a meaningful engagement and impression? I'm not sure we can. And yet, the platforms have a vested interest in doing so. And the media companies have a vested interest in doing so as well. And therefore, they will tell big brands and everyone that this is providing value and get them to spend more and more money. And the brands are used to basically wanting to say, this is great. We bought all these returns, and it was good. And we haven't yet reached the tipping point where some big brands turn around and go, actually, this is not true. Um, we're seeing some fragments of this start. And some companies are starting to suggest, uh, Adidas recently launched a report saying, actually, we spent a load of money on ads, and probably it did nothing for us. So we're starting to see this come about. But this is a problem of just a, a kind of collective, convenient untruth that we're all pretending is, is something that we, we agree with just in order to save face, really. So in reality, a video like this, despite saying what, that it has all the minutes fused, if we discount all of the trivial interactions, probably only has about 2,000 views and uh, uh, sorry, 2,000 views and about 1,000 minutes viewed. So it's far different than the advertised metrics if we discount all the irrelevant ones. Um, and of course, we're used to this sort of data coming from the advertising platforms that we work with. 
Uh, if you ever deal with a Google or a Facebook um, account manager, they are going to basically offer one piece of advice to you in order to improve your performance on every single campaign, which is spend more money. And the more money you spend, the more efficient it's going to be, the more value you're going to get. Everyone can see how this works. Uh, and media agencies who are in charge of the majority of global ad spend are part of this because their business model is predicated on taking a cut of that spend. So they'll take 10% of the spend. They'll encourage you to spend more. There are um, distributors who encourage you to spend more. And then they'll all mark their own homework and say that it's all done really, really well. And it takes a very courageous brand to turn around and say, I don't believe you. Um, so they'll also use metrics like amplification, applause rate, and conversation rate, which essentially is replicating the engagement on social media, how many people commented, how many people liked, how many people shared. Um, and then we'll measure that relative to other brands, and you'll, you'll have reports that say things like, well, we saw a 35% increase in brand amplification rate, uh, which sounds great on paper until you dig in. What that really means is you know, we had a few more shares than we, than we did last year. So there's a lot of obfuscation that goes on in order to hide the truth that most of the time we're buying fairly uh, crappy ad placements with video. Um, so I believe that there's a kind of delusion at play that we're just starting to see emerge in the media where people are going, nah, we're not sure this is working, where everyone is giving Google and Facebook their money, asking Google and Facebook to distribute the videos, then asking Google and Facebook to mark their own homework. They say that they got an A <laughs> on the homework. We believe them, and then we give them more money, and this continues. And, and this is, of course, going to break in the long run, and it'll be interesting to see how that all breaks down and, and what comes of this uh, problem when it emerges. Because, of course, the number of impressions is not the number of people who are impressed. And what we really care about is finding people who are impressed by our creative. So what about the last possible approach, the perhaps correct approach that one can take to the new mobile social media advertising dynamic? Uh, well, there's kind of three ways and reasons why we watch social video. There is we want to get distraction. We just want that dopamine hit. We are bored, we are uh, in and kind of general office day and we want a quick distraction. We'll open our phone and we'll get some hit of a cat video or something to get us on our way for the day. Um, we might want entertainment. We want to find new things to watch, new things to be inspired by, new things that are going to uh, engage with us. Or education, we might want to learn something. We might want to understand more about an issue or a topic that, that is mattering in the world. So. How can brands respond to this? Well, they have to kind of hook into one of these core motivations. And oftentimes, this means moving towards a fairly low common denominator, not necessarily in a pernicious way. Uh, for example, here's a video from Happy Socks. Um, I think it's fairly clear to see what the strategy is with this ad. Okay, distraction, entertainment, it's a cute pug, it's a man wearing socks and underwear. You can see the appeal, it's not saying a lot. Uh, but then it gets slightly weirder. What about this ad that I saw uh, just the other day for a, uh, a company who sell cheese uh, in Britain, and they are trying to hook in with the motivation of Halloween, and somehow thought this was an interesting concept to go with. So take a little cheese square and turn it into a ghost. That's quite cute, quite innovative. But there's some quite strange thinking that's gone on to think, we have our product, which is cheese, and we need to somehow connect this to Halloween. But you can see how that plays out, because they just need to connect to that motivation of distraction and entertainment and education for the moment that everyone's going on social media. So it's really about shoehorning whatever your product and your brand is to the kind of zeitgeist and the time and the, the moments that are going on. And, and this is yeah, obviously quite a challenging problem. Uh, at Wistia, the company I've been working with at the moment, um, we did one of these things where we just made a little video about the hot dog man from Snapchat, for anyone who, who uses that social network. Um, and this is the most viral video we've ever done. But of course, what's critical about it is that it says nothing about our business, nothing about our brand. Uh, and no matter that it did very well and, and secured lots of you know, hundreds of thousands of views and things, uh, it doesn't actually necessarily mean that it had a positive impact on the brand. So all these people who are trying to make viral videos and go viral, uh, it doesn't necessarily help a business because uh, going viral doesn't kind of do sufficiently well for you. So while we may try to meet consumer demand with the videos, it's not necessarily providing the value that we want as a business. Because instead of just building brand awareness, just getting people to know our name, we need to really, in the modern digital world, get people to understand more about us, to like us. 
And brand affinity is driven by identity. It's driven by us determining who we are in the world in relation to others. And the way in which, so, you know, we connect ourselves with brands. We feel like a brand is for us as opposed to for other people. And we try to make that work. Uh, and in a world of, uh, in, in the modern world, that brand affinity often grows with murder, word of mouth within subcultures and communities rather than just about direct consumer experience. Uh, for example, I was in Boston a few weeks ago and I wanted to know what the best lobster roll is in Boston that I could go and get. Now, I have two options. Firstly, I can Google best lobster roll in Boston. But of course, I didn't do that. What I did is I went to a private Slack community and I asked people who I knew from the area what the best lobster roll is in Boston. And they're able to give me much more personalized recommendations from people that I trust, people that I know, and I'm going to take this much more seriously than I would the generic recommendations around the world. So as businesses, how can we market for identities and subcultures? How can we communicate with people in this way? Well, the media industry has worked this out a long time ago. Think about Star Wars. Star Wars is an entire huge subculture and community, and the entire franchise is built off the fandom that has been created. So the key thing that has had to be successful is to find your nerds. Find the people who are really uniquely passionate about a certain topic and speak to them and make something that's genuinely going to appeal to them. And in order to create that long-term affinity, what a lot of innovative businesses are doing is creating binge-worthy content. And what I mean by this is stuff that you can just go and look at and engage with and chomp 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 and, chum -chum and eat it all. Rather than just quick social media videos that are going to interrupt your day and change your view slightly, things that you can really spend a huge amount of time with. And I think this is the way in which the innovative brands are moving on social media. Rather than just short, quick things, it's long. Engage videos targeted for a very small community and subculture. Uh, we see this a little bit with Instagram TV. That's some channels that people are using. But I think the more innovative brands even than that are moving people away from social media on their own website. And an example of this is a company called MailChimp, who some of you may be aware of, but they're an email marketing platform. And MailChimp have recently just moved all of their advertising spend towards original content. And they are basically building their own Netflix, full of things that are for small businesses and for people who are passionate about building modern, ethical small businesses in this kind of new world. And those are the people they're going after. So they are trying to speak to this subculture, this community, in a more interesting manner. And, uh, and they are the, I'll leave you with this quote from their um, head of brand, Mark D. Christina, which is that instead of trying to be the ad in the podcast that people skip over, they are trying to be the podcast. So they are trying to become the platform that people uh, go to in order to consume this content. And they are then using social media to advertise this content. So social media is used to host clips trailers, short form things that really do the job of capturing and giving entertainment, distraction, and education. But then the call to action is to drive people to their platform where they can consume the content in full and then capture email addresses and bring people into their CRM. Because if you can own the distribution channel, you can own the data, and then you can advertise better, and you can build this uh, network of potential consumers and audiences who are immune from all the uh, the flows and the fluxes and everything that goes on with social media. So I would advise you, if you are thinking about this way, to start thinking about meeting user demand with trailers and clips and interesting things that add the distraction and entertainment, but then make the move from social media to somewhere where you can own the experience in full, because that's where you're going to get value from uh, the, the audience themselves. So uh, I hope that was a useful kind of rundown of some of the challenges that brands are, are facing today. Thank you very much. Thank you.